everyone. Welcome to today's uh, TAP colloquium. We're lucky to have Camille Avestruz uh, visiting from the University of Michigan, where she's currently um, a collegiate fellow in the College of Literature, Science and Arts, which is the Amram to an assistant professorship. Uh, she got her PhD from Yale on simulations uh, of uh, cluster outskirts. Since then, she has bro broadened out in scale, both to large and small scales, studying clusters uh, on all scales, including the environment, realization, and uh, a, a variety of computational techniques, including machine learning. <coughs> a lot of that she developed uh, while being first a provost and then a KCP and Fermi Fellow um, at the University of Chicago. Uh, you will hear a lot about her science uh, during her talk. I hope she'll also br briefly mention some of her outreach uh, activities, which range from astronomy on tap um, to a bunch of uh, discussions with various groups and um, science literacy uh, outreach through uh, software carpentry. She's still visiting until um, after lunch tomorrow. So if you would like to uh, still chat with her, um, uh, talk to her, or you can also email me to set up a little time slot. And well, she tell us now about simulations for cluster-based cosmology. Great, thanks Elizabeth. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here. Um, I was telling some folks that the last time I was in Tucson was uh, 11 years ago as a senior in undergrad when I visited Kitt Peak for, um, it was a spring break trip uh, as part of the observational astronomy course I was taking. It was the only asteroid course I, I took, so I have a very positive association with just being in the space overall, and it's glad to be back in the area. Great, so um, I'll be telling you about um, uh, some of the simulation theory efforts uh, towards uh, improving cluster-based cosmology. Um, uh, one example um, here is I'm showing you some mock images of Chandra X-ray galaxy clusters. Oh no, <laughs> and that is a screensaver. Oh no. Um, do I just do enter or? <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay, cool, great. It's not the first time this has happened, I see. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> uh, okay. Um, these are two uh, mock X-ray observations uh, uh, with the Chandra X-ray telescope. Um, one of these clusters is a very relaxed um, cluster, so very uh, quiet, dynamical history in its recent past. And one of these is a very unrelaxed galaxy cluster. Um, and part of looking at uh, dynamical state and how that impacts observables is to understand how we can relate what we're looking at in galaxy clusters to something like their mass, which is um, highly dependent on what recent history they've experienced because that's going to, for instance, impact their shape um, and the strength of a sign an observational signature. So I know this is an afternoon talk and I always get a little tired in the afternoon, so I'm just gonna give you a quick upshot of the talk in less than three minutes, just in case <coughs> at the peak of attention span, <laughs> this is all here. Um, so the primary uh, thrust of, of doing all of these things, sort of the end goal of understanding the nature of dark energy um, and dark matter in, in our universe, the, the contents and evolution of all of these things. Uh, the way we do that with galaxy clusters is we're interested in galaxy clusters' masses, but we can't directly weigh it on a scale, so uh, we have to relate their masses to some observable, so with observable mass relations, but um, galaxy clusters are not idealized objects, they're actual astronomical complex um, uh, things uh, where a number of astrophysical processes can impact the scatter and tilt of that observable mass relation. Uh, in particular, in the centers of galaxy clusters, you are dominated by baryonic effects, so not dark matter, where you'll have feedback from active galactic nuclei, cooling and star formation processes. And if you go further into the outer regions, um, you're impacted by cosmic accretion. Um, so you end up with um, uh, things that break spherical symmetry all the way out here. Um, you'll end up with uh, shocks, uh, things called the splashback radius, a number of things uh, that also impact your observables. Um, and I'm gonna tie this together with a uh, um, sort of a discussion of how we can maximize upcoming data sets uh, to do a cross multi-wavelength approach in order to start to maximize uh, taking observables, either pinning down the mass or something else that can then uh, allow us to con better constrain cosmology. So just a brief uh, introduction um, for any students in the room. Uh, right, the vast majority of the energy budget of our universe is largely unknown. What we do know, largely, uh, in terms of the laboratory, is atoms which comprise about 4%, so the Earth, the Sun, us. 
Coal dark matter um, is this non-luminous uh, component to the mass budget, so the majority of the mass in our universe, uh, which uh, to our knowledge uh, mostly just interacts gravitationally, um, so it's weakly interacting and we don't see any signatures uh, emit, emitting in uh, electromagnetic uh, ways yet. Um, and the vast majority of everything else is uh, in this mysterious thing called dark energy, which is responsible for the accelerated expansion of our universe. So that's the big question mark. Now, galaxy clusters in particular probe cosmology um, because their sheer masses uh, and existence are sensitive to the tension between uh, the gravitational infall and collapse of structure, so how much matter you're going to have in the universe, oh, um, and dark energy, where the accelerated expansion of the universe suppresses structure formation. So if we were to be able to count the number of galaxy clusters as a function of mass as a function of time, this starts to probe this tension between the two. So what I just described to you is called the uh, quote, uh, galaxy cluster mass function, uh, which essentially is the cluster number density as a function, function of cluster mass. So this is one of the earliest, earlier constraints on um, uh, galaxy cluster um, galaxy cluster source uh, cosmology, where um, in blue, um, you see the mass function earlier on in time, about five billion years ago, um, uh, the solid line is from simulations, so if you take n-body simulations, assume a set of cosmological parameters, spit out what the mass function should be, and uh, do that in a number of um, cosmology bins, you can figure out what the best cosmology um, is for a given set of data points, shown with the error bars. And because of hierarchical structure, later on in time, you end up with more galaxy clusters at a given mass as a function of time, and back then, right, this is the, the constraint on omega lambda, um, the energy density of dark energy. So, right, these masses in particular come from the Chandra X-ray telescope, uh, but as I mentioned before, galaxy clusters, getting their masses out of there, that's not something you could just simply do by plopping a galaxy cluster on a scale, right? This is not a laboratory experiment. This is an experiment where we have to infer what the actual mass is from observables. So the crux of all of this problem is one does not simply weigh a galaxy cluster. We have to find a way to do that in some alternative uh, fashion. So if we're looking at the gas, say through the X-ray emission, um, uh, oftentimes uh, the, we need to use gas measurements to tell us about the mass, assuming hydrostatic equilibrium. Right? This is the assumption that thermal pressure balances out small gravity. Um, and as a function of radius, the way um, uh, folks uh, do this in a standard way is we do uh, radial uh, measurements of the pressure as a function of radius. So pressure you get from temperature and density, temperature you get from your spectra, density essentially how many photons you get from a portion of the sky that's x-ray emitting. Uh, so from this we can test that proxy with simulations because right the, the issue here again is that all of your observables are going to give you proxies. So these are two examples uh, of, um, of uh, integrated line of sight density and temperature for a simulated galaxy cluster from which you can now uh, generate mock x-ray observations and do sort of an end-to-end -end comparison to get this on an apples-to-apples -apples basis uh, to compare with um, what observations might be measuring. So you take your density and you take your temperature. This assumes you're going to run a fully hydrodynamic simulation and you generate a mock or synthetic Chandra x-ray observation um, to show that you're capturing some of the cosmic uh, features of a uh, fully cosmological simulation, I'm showing some substructures here that have come in from uh, infall from the outer regions. So if you were to run that mock x-ray uh, uh, through uh, observation through <coughs> the entire pipeline to retrieve the mass, uh, this is what it looks like. So this is mass as a function of scaled radius. From the simulation data, because it's a simulation you can go in there and ask what is the true mass as a function of radius, that's shown in black. From your quote x-ray measurements, so that image that I showed you in the previous slide, um, that's this dashed line right here. And the fractional deviation is the bottom panel. You'll notice from quote x-ray measurements, uh, there appears to be roughly 20-ish percent deviation in the inner and the outer regions. So tying back to what I mentioned before in that um, summary slide, the inner regions and outer regions are due to astrophysical effects. So um, in the inner regions, that's due to things like active galactic nuclei, so it's not simply thermal pressure that's contributing to um, uh, your hydrostatic equilibrium. You have other things going on in the central regions. Um, and in the outer regions, that's cosmic inflow. So 
right? Back to the issue that mass proxies are proxies with assumptions. So tying observables in with mass is not going to always work out the way we want it to. So the observable that I just talked through um, in the past few slides is for the x-ray, where the bias that, you're, um, that was uh, illustrated is called the hydrostatic mass bias. So you're always going to be biased uh, low because there are going to be other sources, non-thermal pressure support that contribute um, to the pressure measurements, uh, that contribute to supporting the mass from collapse. Um, so that's the x-ray, but every observable has different challenges. So um, this is sort of a cartoon schematic of a bunch of different observables, and where they sit in this hypothetical or well, cartoon-like accuracy versus precision um, 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 plot. So I, I always sort of, I forget the meanings of words unless I have a mental image, so this is sort of the high accuracy um, is um, uh, if you're well-centered on the bullseye, um, and then high precision if you're clustered together, repeated measurements always show up. So, for something like an X-ray measure, right, mm -hmm. um, you're going to have a systematic offset. This is because galaxy clusters um, have a number of these systematics. And it's actually, uh, when you're doing cluster-based cosmology, it is systematics uh, limited, not um, statistical statistics limited. Um, so a lot of the measurements um, are limited by that perspective. And over here, um, so this is a lot of the, the gas uh, components, and then you also have optical richness, uh, which is um, probing the actual galaxies. Weak lensing and galactic dynamics directly probe the depth of the potential well of the galaxy cluster. So here you have high accuracy and low precision. So if you have a bunch of things sitting down here and a bunch of things sitting up here, there, um, the answer uh, over a number of years has been to now actually we'll ask what happens if we then combine observables. So um, just to recap, galaxy cluster's dynamical state ties in with systematics um, uh, to any one of these observables, right? What we want to get at, or what has been traditionally done, is to get at an observable mass relation. From that, you construct a galaxy cluster mass function and extract some um, uh, cosmology out of that in terms of parameter constraints. So if we're asking how galaxy cluster dynamical state ties in with systematics, well, okay, that means we have to understand how a galaxy cluster's dynamical state arrives um, at the state that it's in, and how that then translates to what you're observing, and how that impacts a variety of systematics. And to do this, oh, sorry. that's the same sound my phone makes, so it's just like, oh no. Um, and uh, if we're tying this in with systematics um, to, to ask in, uh, to what degree, um, and uh, are there ways that um, it um, uh, correspondingly impacts systematics in one observable as it does in another? Okay, so let's take a look at what has happened over the last couple of years and one example of how combining observables can improve constraints. Um, so this is um, a, a cosmology uh, parameter constraint plot where uh, I'm showing the mass variance in eight megaparsec spheres uh, uh, versus the um, energy density of matter. Uh, this is from a paper in 2014 from a project called Weighing the Giants, where essentially what they'd done was they'd iteratively taken um, constraints from the x-ray and then calibrated them with weak lensing. So if you look at how the cosmology constraints, the bananas, have improved and shrunk over time, uh, from 2008 to 2010, so that's going from this big yellow to the green, uh, you'll notice that it, it, it shrunk quite a bit in this direction, and that's largely due to the additional number of cluster counts, so going and uh, uh, improving uh, the statistical constraining power of galaxy clusters with X-ray measurements, and in this direction, um, that's because in 2014, um, there is additional uh, weak lensing um, measurements added onto this, so right, combining the X-ray was something you can get with an optical. And mass calibration shrunk it down largely in uh, this direction there. So you can think of the mass calibration from weak lensing as anchoring the observable mass relation that has that overall systematic bias for the X-ray in particular. So here, this is a great example of like, what you can do when you start to combine um, observables. And the thing that we want to do, right, is to do that with um, as many um, wavelengths as possible, with as many clusters as possible. And this is actually now the generation where we're going to have larger and larger data sets from surveys for galaxy clusters. So just to compare, um, this is a series of um, um, uh, different uh, telescopes across multiple wavelengths where it's showing the limiting mass of that particular uh, survey as a function of redshift. Um, and right, so, and here, this is current and future surveys. 
So if we were to just uh, say focus on something like uh, um, in <coughs> SC, SBT is here in blue, and you'll notice that the limiting mass goes down um, with, uh, with, a, with SBT pole, which is the next generation. Uh, for uh, looking at this in the, um, uh, between say SDSS and LSST, so this is not yet uh, um, in operation, but we'll start taking data in around 2021, you can see how um, LSST is pushing further out into redshift. So a combination of all of these surveys are pushing both down in mass and out in redshift uh, to look earlier and earlier on in time. So we're getting lower masses and objects that are further and further away. Um, uh, as another way to look at this is to look at the sheer number of uh, galaxy clusters. So this is the density of galaxy clusters found per volume. Um, and again, just like to focus the eyes on SDSS and LSST, you'll notice that you're increasing uh, in terms of the number of clusters, density clusters found, and again, further out in redshift, consistent with the previous slide. So um, there's orders, an order of magnitude, at least, in terms of the improvements across many of these types of wavelengths. So this is now really the time to start to think about the best ways to combine these uh, probes and also to start building the infrastructure necessary to um, both analyze the data and interpret the data. So um, a much more recent um, uh, effort to incorporate multi-wavelength approaches is from um, a paper by Arya Faraki and a uh, companion paper by Sarah Mulroy, where they took 41 locus clusters um, for which there were 11 different um, observables. So um, essentially, um, there, there aren't many clusters yet where you can start to be able to do this, but the locus sample uh, is a relatively homogeneous selection where they were able to collect um, 11 different um, observables. Um, and uh, to combine those to then pull out a posterior mass from the hierarchical Bayesian modeling uh, to combine all observables. So here, this is, these are, uh, leave all 41 clusters <laughs> of, of the measurements that they made, uh, comparing um, in gray the posterior mass that they got from combining those observables with what uh, you get if you just simply extract out a weak lensing mass measurement in, in uh, red. Um, so um, uh, you'll notice that right, this is this is type of thing that might be noisy, noisier, um, or have um, a, a larger error bar uh, on a single cluster by cluster basis. But if you're able now to also do this for a large number of clusters on a statistical sense, you can start to maybe constrain um, your observable mass relation, um, and then start uh, to uh, w work out in the wash additional systematics that might only be. Uh, seen if you were to use the weak lensing mass alone. So here, um, this is showing um, how each of these, um, a handful of these uh, observables, so here this is LX and YX, which is um, essentially uh, taking both the X-ray temperature and your, uh, your gas mass as a combined observable, how that, uh, those two observables correlate, taking a look at the gas mass alone, and then, um, so you'll notice right, there's, there's, um, uh, a significant correlation coefficient for, for these things. So if you're starting to combine all of your information, you're getting more information out of that given that many of the observables correlate or anti-correlate. So what this also shows is that a comparison between um, uh, previous observations from Franz et al. in um, uh, some of the error bar points, the bands are from uh, the posterior, or sorry, from the measurements that they got from the locus clusters. And in particular, you can see that in the three different colors here, these are uh, showing comparisons with simulations. So I, I bring this particular plot up to highlight that it's important not only to uh, show that you have somewhat of an understanding of uh, why, they why they correlate because you can start to dig into simulations, but also these simulations, you need to compare with a wide range of simulations. One of these is particle-based and the other one is grid-based, so you know that you're not just um, dependent on a particular numerical scheme. So I thought this was a really nice example of how, um, of the direction that, that um, many folks are gonna start going into once we have a sufficient amount of data to um, compare the simulations and also collating all the simulations that are publicly available or make new friends if they're not publicly available in order to do this uh, in tandem. So um, when bringing up that each simulation uh, has a slightly different approach, um, I'm just gonna highlight an example from uh, an undergrad at the University of Michigan who is applying for graduate schools, uh, who has taken a look at comparing different simulations, um, uh, one from uh, Bahamas Maxis, so this is a UK group, 
One is Magneticum, so this is a Germany-based group, and the other is uh, TNG, the next generation, um, which is largely um, a Harvard group that is also spread out. And what he's looked at is that he's looked at the um, uh, uh, probability uh, of uh, given galaxy cluster having a number of satellites given its mass, um, and looking at that uh, PDF, and you'll notice that there's a little bit of a difference uh, with TNG. So this is not me pointing out that one simulation is correct or not. I don't think that's a good approach in discussing a variety of simulations. But it's important to see what things are consistent and what things vary depending on your numerical implementation of, say, your feedback processes or even just how you're solving the grid physics. So um, uh, one thing to take away from this is right, it's like it's roughly following all of them a similar log normal distribution with slight differences at the peak. So um, his work is to quantify the differences and robustness of model predictions with um, a procedure called local linear regression. Um, and this is one example of one particular ob observable that you can do this with uh, using satellite statistics. Um, and the main goal of this is to inform optically selected cluster counts. So another thing you can look at is to figure out why uh, a distribution looks, at the, looks like the way it does. Right? You can't easily do this in observations necessarily unless you have other probes of various physical processes. But in simulations, you can just go in there, pull out some data, look at, say, the star formation histories, look at um, the um, formation times for every single halo that hosts a galaxy in your, in your simulation. Um, so what, um, what he's done is that he split the sample between late forming and early forming galaxy clusters, uh, showing that uh, part of where the peak sits has to do with where um, what the, the uh, history of a given galaxy cluster um, might have been. So you'll notice that um, uh, the early forming have a slight shift upwards in terms of the residuals and looking at that distribution. So when you're starting to look at early versus late forming, one particular um, good indicator of something like accretion history um, is tended to be shape in terms of that dynamical history. Uh, shapes have been shown to be fairly sensitive to both accretion history and cosmology, which then impacts your observable mass relations. So um, there's been a number of uh, works in the past that show how this might vary, say with sigma eight, um, or how this might um, uh, depend on the environment. Uh, but uh, in recent work um, by a graduate student I worked with, we decided to look at shape morphology in particular as a key relaxedness criterion and to explicitly tie that in with uh, the history of the galaxy cluster. So um, in the past, a key relaxedness criterion has been something like bulky symmetry measures. So like if you take isophotes and you look at how that rotates around over as a function of radius, that's likely to be a galaxy cluster that's experienced more activity in its past. Another measure for folks in the x-ray business um, uh, has been to look at peakiness, right? So um, the thought process here is that if you have a cool core cluster where the central regions have sort of peaked up in this uh, uh, cool regime, in this, uh, uh, if you're looking at x-ray surface brightness, um, likely it has not recently experienced a major merger that's sufficient to disrupt that central region. So this is another measure that folks have used also in the past. And some other folks have used some combination of visual measures in the x-ray. Um, but these are not necessarily tied in with um, what you can pull out of um, simulations because to a large extent, these are built by observer to say, how can we classify the things that we're seeing? So um, taking this into simulations where you can um, have a relatively homogeneously selected sample, um, uh, a student and I had looked at uh, the varied shapes in a mass limited sample called the Omega 500 sample. This was uh, 500, um, uh, box run uh, at Yale University a handful of years ago. But um, so it gives you about 62 clusters with a, a good uh, lower limit range. Um, and the nice thing is you can compare between uh, different implementations of physics. So just a non rated run where you don't include any galaxy formation processes, adding on iteratively cooling, star formation, and then finally um, AGN to see how uh, different physical implementations um, might actually impact the net results. So just folks who work in large collaborations, especially in surveys, um, when I speak to them, they always appreciate the value of having uh, collaborative work. But I always want to point out that this is definitely also true for simulator simulators where um, teamwork is needed for large scale simulations. Every single person here contributed to that particular large box run. And then for the next generation, it's probably going to require even more people. 
So taking a look at those observed, uh, sorry, mock observed galaxy clusters, um, graduate student at UChicago, Huanqing Chen, uh, decided to separate out and really figure out um, what the difference was between a shape indicator, something that was a slow creator, and a fast creator. So these are the exact two clusters I showed you in the very beginning of the talk in that opening slide, where this is a very round, slow creator um, with the turtle and the hair, and here is an elongated um, uh, cluster um, that is uh, accreting quite a lot of material in its recent past. So just for reference, all of these lines, these are overplotted X-ray relaxation criteria from one of those combined measures that I've mentioned before. So she took the uh, sample of um, galaxy clusters uh, from the Omega 500 simulation, uh, ran all these measures for sort of sanity checks, like, okay, this is something that we can do in simulations. But the key thing that you could really do in simulations is you can um, explicitly measure the shape axis ratio and the accretion rate because you know uh, how what a galaxy cluster's progenitors are and to take a look at how much mass is accreted over some function of time. And that time scale is something that we varied because another thing we're interested in is what is the necessary time scale that we care about in terms of defining relaxation. And the last thing she took a look at was the uh, maximum merger ratio um, uh, that a, a galaxy cluster has experienced in the past. So. Um, one bulk finding is that the accretion rate and accretion mode matter in determining the shape um, depending on what a galaxy cluster's past uh, has been. So overall, here this is shape as a function of uh, accretion rate. So going down are more elliptical galaxy clusters and going to the right are faster accreting. Here I've circled um, galaxy clusters with different bins of maximum merger ratio. You'll notice it's a relatively smooth um, Ish distribution, however noisy, in terms of uh, shape versus accretion rate in this anti-correlation. Um, but the merger ratio seems to impact things like how you're scattering about here. So digging further into this, oops, um, just for reference also, sorry, this is the uh, round cluster at the very top left corner, and this is the very actively uh, creating cluster at the bottom right corner. So digging further into this, um, we want to ask that question again, right? What is the characteristic time scale for shape relaxation? Folks have defined like relaxation in terms of say TDU ratio or um, something that you can see, um, other things you can see in, in a snapshot um, or looking at residual um, uh, gas motions after a major merger event. Um, but in this case, we're defining shape relaxation as like, okay, well, if it's spherical, it's likely more shape relaxed, um, but it's gonna take some time to do that. And so in a statistical fashion, what she did was she took um, what the Spearman coefficient was, measuring the shape of galaxy clusters as a function of radii, varying over the time scale at which she's measuring that accretion rate. So, um, so increasing negative correlation is going down and just going out, this is a radial profile of that correlation coefficient. So you'll notice that um, starting from uh, expansion factor 0.5, um, you get a stronger correlation up until you hit 0.7, and then it starts to weaken again until you get about to 0.9. So this corresponds to about four and a half gig years, um, uh, where you have the strongest correlation of um, accretion rate with shape. And um, this number is uh, nice and interesting because it's consistent with the amount of time um, found to, that it took for gas motions to relax after major merger uh, from a paper back in 2012. So this is now tying together, okay, so measure of relaxation by gas motions, uh, there's some parallels between that and also measure of relaxation with shape. If you say exclude the major mergers, um, an interesting thing happens where you weaken the correlation in the central regions, um, similar time scale dependence. Um, but uh, what this is saying is that you need a major merger in order to actually really upset the shape in the inner regions. So if you're uh, taking a look at measuring uh, galaxy clusters and isophotes or something along those lines at larger radii, um, uh, you're going to be less sensitive to that, but if you care about something the major merger might have done, it's still true, the inner regions are gonna be most affected. Okay, so let's connect this all back to that observable mass relation that's like the crux of <laughs> doing cluster-based cosmology, right? So as, um, so one thing that you can connect this to is to the residual of the observable mass relation. Um, so if that observable is something like the X-ray temperature, um, you can take a look at how the residual, um, so essentially the, the distance between any of these uh, orange dots with the yellow fit, 
um, varies as a function of accretion rate. And what's going on here is that we're seeing that um, faster accreting clusters tend to be um, relatively cool <coughs> with respect to the mean relation of the axon. So what's happening here is actually um, something uh, that has to do with uh, the thermalization rate of a galaxy cluster, right? Because a galaxy cluster is accreting a lot of material, there's a lot of residual gas motions. It takes some time for those gas motions to then thermalize and contribute to that thermal pressure support to keep uh, the galaxy cluster um, from collapsing in. So if you've just recently accreted a lot of material, uh, you as a galaxy cluster have not yet had enough time to then uh, thermalize and then work your way back up um, above the residual line or you start to approach the median of it. Um, so if you uh, take a look at the shape axis ratio, you see that um, the corollary to that where rounder and hotter galaxy clusters, um, uh, uh, rounder cl galaxy clusters tend to be hotter with respect to the TXM relation as well. So this is where we can start to tease out like the cause and effect to something that paints into the observable mass relation. This is a very case example of one particular um, observable and uh, one particular uh, uh, delve into what a galaxy cluster is experiencing. But the point of doing this type of a thing is because you can then build groundwork for what I'm going to call baryon phase transcriptions, where you can start to now more empirically model your <coughs> galaxy cluster observables. So just as a schematic of what you do when you're quote baryon pasting, many of you are likely already familiar with just the semiotic models of um, galaxy formation, but essentially for clusters you would have some halo property like a mass, your recent accretion rate, maybe the shape in the dark matter, and then you'd want to paste onto that some observable like an integrated property like yx, tx, um, or profile. So um, this is uh, uh, some work that's gained um, some traction at least within the LST uh, Dark Energy Science Collaboration and some extended folks who are like, yeah, I want to baryon paste stuff for more cluster statistics. <laughs> um, I think this group has grown since the last time we compiled some pictures, but so far um, there's a number of folks from a wide range of institutions. Um, uh, you have uh, represent local representation here with Hongjin, but a number of us are interested from a, uh, in different aspects of quote baryon pasting uh, for the purposes of then carrying this through to help interpret and or um, connect with uh, the multi-wavelength observations. So overall, uh, Ken Osato at the University of Tokyo and Irwin at Miami are taking the lead in, in really putting together the pipeline for this, but essentially you would wanna go from something like a halo catalog or dark matter particles and spit out some FITS images that looks like an observable quantity. Um, so and just to give you some ideas, some science goals, we are also like looking for more people to join <laughs> um, and join the discussions as well as uh, we want more accurate modeling of selection functions, uh, seek reasonable multivariate mass observable relations, not just a single mass versus observable, um, and see how this modifies a variety, of, largely in, in the lensing crowd, uh, a, a variety of observables as well. <coughs> Number of planned efforts going on, but there's just always room for, for more folks to join. Um, just to give you some examples of what folks have done so far, uh, so Ken has taken um, um, the Shaw uh, relatively simplified pressure profile uh, model calibrated from state relations and pasted this on um, to an all sky mock. Um, and um, actually, I believe this, he has used this already in, in HSC Planck analyses. So, this is something that's um, starting to get worked into a variety of um, collaborations in order to further the science goals. Um, so, just as a reminder, there are any uh, students in the room, the SE effect is simply a backlight mm -hmm. where uh, the CMB. Uh, gets upscattered by hot electrons in a galaxy cluster, so you end up with um, cold and hot spots when you look at uh, the uh, CMB um, um, image. So, and that's just one example of galaxy clusters. So this is a mock containing things that look similar to a real um, uh, galaxy cluster, either upscattering or downscattering compared to the CMB. Erwin Lau has started um, working uh, with um, folks in um, both Argonne and also here now at Nagoya in order to um, paste baryons um, into, um, to make X-ray and YSC images. So the input here is a light cone simulation and that was transferred into making some early X-ray and SC maps from LSST simulations for the data challenge um, that's been coming out of uh, the comp computational science working groups there. So, right, a lot of folks in LST, it's like, all right, how do we properly paste on galaxies? But if you want to do some multi-wavelength efforts, it's, there's also the question of how do we paint on some X-ray observables and SC observables. Um, 
Can anyone tell me maybe something's a little bit off from these images? Maybe idealized. Yeah? There's no noise. Okay, yes, there's no noise, but then something else from an object to object. <laughs> yes, <laughs> early stage for sure. But something else uh, in terms of like, you look at individual uh, bright spots, like the biggest ones especially, relatively idealized, but individual, very bright. Galaxy clusters. All spheres. They're all spheres, yeah. So taking into account, thank you. <laughs> so taking into account the additional information from say, how the galaxy cluster's history now impacts its elongation um, when uh, you're taking a look at, um, or just, you know, just much more regular um, features in, in the maps, uh, that's not yet been accounted for. So right, in terms of stages, that's something that we believe is gonna be actually quite important in being able uh, to fold into multi-wavelength efforts. Um, so um, I'm gonna, a little short on time, so I'm just gonna skip over some of these. Um, let me say a little bit about some efforts um, uh, with an LSST desk. I think it's, is, is it 4.30? That 3.30 we started, right? Uh, uh, 3.45. 3.30. Oh, oh, we're still good. <laughs> like, should have looked at the clock first off. All right, so some efforts going on in LSST desk within um, the Galaxy Cluster Sparking Group. One of the teams um, who's working to calibrate the weak lensing masses, right? So like, if you remember in that image of like um, uh, accuracy and precision, weak lensing is, is over on the upper left-hand corner, but there is still going to be like a slight systematic bias, um, especially when you have like these line of sight effects or is um, your weak lensing mass is going to also be model dependent. So just to remind you of what the weak lensing, um, how you get out a weak lensing mass, if you have a bunch of uh, background galaxy clusters, in this case, cartoon-like and spherical, and you plop down a very massive galaxy cluster right in front of it, um, you're going to um, elongate light coming from uh, the background galaxy clusters, um, and these uh, background, sorry, background galaxies, and these background galaxies are uh, going to experience um, some kind of shear in terms of how the viewer is going to see it. Um, but these are typically much, 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 much smaller than what you see here. This almost looks like strong lensing uh, at this point. So you have to do this um, in a statistical fashion. So when you do this, right, a weak lensing mass estimate um, has a model dependence. Essentially what you do is, right, you take shears, maybe you stack it, or maybe you do a bunch of noisy um, measurements, uh, and you uh, fit what the mass profile would be uh, for a galaxy cluster to shear background galaxies in the way that you see it sheared. And typically when you do that, you have to assume kind of a, some kind of a model profile. Typically it's going to be an NFW profile um, where you say this is how the dark matter density should vary as a function of radius, and you're going to fit some free parameters. Oftentimes when you're using NFW, then people are going to want to uh, uh, decrease the number of parameters that you're fitting if you feel like you know something well enough, like say the concentration mass relation. So the NFW profile has concentration and mass as a parameter. So if you assume a concentration mass relation, um, uh, you're going to be able to then uh, pull out um, uh, a mass posterior. Um, but here's just an example output of um, some code testing the bias. So this is um, the mass you measure divided by the true mass of uh, some simulated halos uh, varying your concentration assumptions. And you can see that the mass bias is very uh, sensitive to what you're assuming about the concentration. So there are a number of these kinds of systematics that would be um, good to test for and also maybe like fold into something like a hierarchical model, um, but requires um, an entire pipeline and a team working towards improving that, right? So there's a number of things that you'd want to test, and centering, selection effects, um, see the effects of stacking versus doing some sort of a noisy individual fit, uh, if not just NFWs, check some other things um, uh, and vary whatever else you can think of in order to get a handle on all those systematics. So LSSD is going to be the primary driver in terms of making those measurements. Um, um, many of you must have, have probably been hearing a lot about this um, uh, in the recent past, and Eduardo is the, um, um, uh, one of the co convenors for the Galaxy Cluster uh, Working Group. Um, but because we're going to have this large number of galaxy clusters, that's going to give us the amount of data to start to do uh, these statistical constraints um, or modeling tests. So this is, oh, that's not yesterday. I should have updated that. But that was like a really awesome eclipse that they took that like, popped up in the uh, LSD Facebook group of LSD um, 
getting more and more built uh, with a lovely eclipse uh, in the background. So in order to build uh, those kinds of um, uh, infrastructure uh, for something as large as LSST with uh, the amount of person power, the amount of analysis, the amount of data that's going to be coming in, um, I personally have felt that a lot of the collaboration has thrived off of these hack or quote sprint weeks. Um, and uh, this is uh, now dated, but like example of a 2018 collaboration meeting hack day project <coughs> coming out of the team working in cluster mass modeling where the goal here was essentially to put together a tutorial for someone to easily onboard someone to join the Galaxy Cluster um, uh, cluster mass calibration work uh, team within the working group. Um, uh, we've had a series of hack sprint weeks, or uh, retreats rather. This is one in Pittsburgh uh, um, last summer. Um, more of <coughs> representation um, uh, right here. Uh, and we'll make full use of hack days, except this particular picture was taken not on the hack day at the tail end of sprint week, or at the tail end of the collaboration meeting, but it was taken on the Saturday when people insisted they wanted to keep hacking. This is how fun it is. <laughs> so if you're not yet part of LSST or thinking of joining or like wondering how to plug in, um, it's just a really great community, and, and that's maybe a little bit more what I'm advertising here. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and um, this is another hack retreat. Um, and it's a good reason to travel to fun places. So this is both in Germany and I thought I'd like end up over here, but it was a great campus to hang out in with a really great crowd. Um, and I also wanted to bring up, right, so being able to do all these things, it's, it's, we're doing it in sort of an open source fashion where it's like, hey, anyone who wants to join, the code is publicly visible. We're planning to go for a version 1.0 release in the next like handful of months, depending on how much we can squeeze out of other hack sessions. Um, everyone's coming in from a different institution. It's only these times when we come together that we have like this focused work, like hundreds of pull requests, <laughs> and, and actually feel like we're like significant portion of the milestone towards that version 1.0 release. Um, but a lot of being able to duck into ongoing software development work like this uh, requires early training in data and computation. Um, so most of the folks I do work with um, already have this coming in, um, but this is something that um, I've been thinking a lot about over the last decade um, in terms of just onboarding even undergrads to start um, get to start getting hacking in whatever they that could be useful in terms of adding to a collaboration. So um, this is just ad an advertisement of Software Carpentry. There's now a, a partner um, organization, Data Carpentry, where the goal is to teach basic lab skills for research computing. Um, but it's it's a nonprofit, um, volunteer-based organization. I've been teaching with them for like the last ten years. Um, this is an example of syllabus. It's, it's um, U of A has had some of these, but I couldn't quite tell if like um, astronomy and physics has necessarily um, hosted one of them. But this is something that you can ask for volunteers to come to your department. The only thing you have to pay for is like if they have to uh, if volunteer instructors have to. Uh, uh, lodge or travel a significant distance. Typically that's not true. I think there's a critical mass even here. But like students over the course of two days are going to receive a crash course in the Unix shell, version control with Git, programming Python. If you do some other sort of a thing, there's ways to cater to the um, other skill sets as well. Um, but I've hosted this both at like previous host departments that I've been in um, and taken this to some professional meetings. I don't think we're going to have this at the AAS this year, but we've had it in previous years. Uh, Sognos, the Society for the Advancement of uh, uh, Chicanos and Americans in Science has had this uh, over the last couple of years. So if there's some other professional society that you have and um, access to and you're like, oh, this would be great for all the starting grad students, um, something to plug into. Um, and before I wrap up, I just wanted to bring up a highlight on the aside. I have an awesome, awesome undergrad who is graduating this year and applying for graduate schools. Um, she's she just had her second paper out. This is her first paper on the reionization history of present day halos. Now she's looking at the galaxy connection um, during the epic reionization. But if you're on the committee, I highly um, cannot um, uh, uh, recommend her more for, for a program in Astro. Um, she's pretty awesome. So I'm just going to wrap up now um, a little early because I skipped over some things I thought would take more time. But this is really more time for questions. But we're really going to need a confluence of n-body, hydro, and semiotic models to fully leverage the next generation of cosmology experience. I've experimented with <coughs> giving you like a small sampling of some efforts that I'm locally like in my spheres, but there's a number of folks doing these sorts of things. But I do think if we somewhat combine efforts, <laughs> then we can do this much more efficiently. Um, one main thing that I do want to bring up, um, I think 
folks in galaxy formation know very well is that accretion history, like the past of any given object, um, uh, matters quite a bit and a lot more than whatever you just think you see in a snapshot. Um, and so something like the accretion history is going to definitely be the cr a critical component in developing further models to do something like baryon painting onto dark matter only simulations. Um, because you can't really, it's much more expensive to try to run many, many different models of hydro <laughs> with large boxes to capture the same statistical size and vary parameters uh, over that simulation space. So the empirical way is probably gonna be the way to go for this. And in terms of plugging into a lot of collaborations, community code development is definitely gonna be playing a key role, especially in the era, era of LSST. Um, so if you're a student or you have students or like you're a postdoc who's trying to look to get into something new, like this is a really great space to do that. So yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. All right, this leaves us uh, with plenty of time for questions for Camille. Your turn. So the, the shape modeling is kind of fairly simple, right? Yeah. It's just axial ratios. So do you think that there would be more to learn if we could figure out a more complicated Structure for using, you know, big scope expansions or various other like decomposing things for regular functions and spherical harmonics and all the rest of it to actually understand the shape. Oh, you know, like fully deconstruct like the like the shape of take take yeah. the galaxy because cluster and really. Yeah, you're sort of assuming that something is you know not relaxed based on just how you elongate it. Yeah, so that is a very uh, like one dimensional simplified um, yeah. criterion for relaxation. Um, so there, are, I think the more information you add. Um, the more you'll learn. So like talking about the internal structure, folks have done things like, so, so one version is like you could do a subhalo count, right? Or if you do some sort of like, um, um, like within space to see how much substructure there is, you can do that in like a flat image as well. So, so folks will do things like that. It's not clear to me what combination of things should be added to a model um, off the bat. Um, I feel like shape is definitely a good first initial step forward because um, Shape is something that pops out of like the rockstar catalog. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, in the long run, adding more, uh, I guess, features to how you're classifying something and more measures um, will be important. I am i don't know if it's necessarily important, because I think what you're talking about is also just some small scale structures in there as well. No, no, I mean, I mean large work. scale, right? Oh, large so, scale, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so I do mean like when you're talking about something that's elongated, oh, yeah. there's mm -hmm. one way to do it just to fit in an ellipse that's been elongated, but, right. like, but you could have very non symmetric terms in other oh, ways. And yeah, that could yeah. actually and have more really images. decompose yeah. what is actually not an equilibrium versus something. That else. would be pretty cool to 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 pull out. Yeah, so more than just C over A and D over yeah. A. Like like more yeah. yeah. Um I think that'd be a really cool project. Um it'd be great if I had like a student to like <laughs> code that up. Um or if you know of codes that easily do that. You, you, you may be able to Oh maybe we should tell them. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Cool. So it's a balance between like, trying something cool and new and like what's the infrastructure needed for it? Yeah. for exploration, I don't think folks have quite done the sensitivity test for that yet. So that, that is a really good question, um, right? Because then, yeah, that's sort of a more visible probe to the overall depth potential well. But um, I would like to look into that. That's a good question, yeah. But folks aren't really quite talking about that yet, <coughs> as far as I know, right? <laughs> In L yeah. and there's, there's, so like, I think the YSO Leopold has done some kind of this with HGC imaging. For HGC, okay. Uh, it's about the same gap. And, okay. And uh, Yuan Yuan Chang has been doing this from the DS yes. side, but you know the coats will reach roughly the single epoch. Mm -hmm. So can you say something about the feedback on the galaxy cluster? Feedback? Oh, like from the AGN or? Yeah. Yeah, I think the dominant feedback for cluster is. That's right, yeah, you're in the master range past the knee where it's like now EGN dominated. So um, uh, I guess one thing I can point out is that, um, so the, the shape relationship with accretion rate, um, if you um, add just cooling and star formation, 
Um, it, it roughly, it, it changes that relation, but the AGN works to essentially, where you're measuring between 0.4 and 1 R500 critical, it sort of undoes what the cooling star formation um, changes in your shapes. Uh, so what I can say is that adding AGN feedback or having AGN feedback as a component in addition to cooling and star formation in an effective fashion is important um, to, uh, but it's also comparable to the non-radiative um, measurements as well, which is kind of a nice thing to know. <laughs> like if you want to run something cheap, it's just close enough. So you talked a lot about how, you know, we can always use all these things to try to do periodic fixing and whatnot, but do you have a sense of how well we can use all these observer, right? Like if I give you a Chandra map, how well can I use my Chandra map to infer accretion rate and therefore predict that it's something like a flashback radius? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, um, so if you have like a really good Chandra map measurement where you get like pretty good isotope measurements to from something like 0.3 to one, uh, you could start to infer, not necessarily that there are multiple things that might cause differences in shape, but you can start to infer like, oh, well, it looks like for um, maybe um, uh, this experienced a major merger because the central regions are a little bit more affected versus not, but, and that's also comparable to when people start to look at double peaks in the middle. Um, for um, if for splashback, um, I know there's been some talk of say take um, something like the shape measurements or the, the overall spot relaxation criteria, maybe slightly better um, uh, calibrated to the simulations and take a look at stack measurements of something like splashback of things that look relaxed and things that look um, unrelaxed, because you would expect for the unrelaxed clusters to be faster accreting. I don't think you can quite get like a measurement out of it. I think you would need to start looking at uh, involving galaxies for that sort of thing. But, but if you can fit it into like relatively relaxed, relatively unrelaxed, and get something like, oh, a smaller splashback for something that's recently accreting, um, because it has a faster change in mass, so essentially when you bounce back, it's gonna be a lot closer than what happens in the splashback. Um, then that, that would be a nice demonstration that you're sort of measuring things that are consistent with the physical picture that you have. Um, but in terms of sort of inferring particular numbers, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the, the type of science in there too. Yeah. So um, I might have missed this, but when you were comparing the number of satellites with three different simulations oh, including yeah. TNG 300. Mm -hmm. So did all three of those simulations have baryons in them? Yeah. And so these are the, you're taking at them the baryonic results as well. And do you have a sense of what, I, I don't know if I followed what was going on with TNG 300 in terms of why exactly? Oh, the satellites were slightly, the satellite distribution was slightly different. Um, so, I mean, I, I know typically at least they haven't, um, so um, Diane hasn't quite looked at as to the why it okay. looks different in terms of like what in the implementation is causing that. But I do know like, from what I understand, like for instance, feedback is a little bit different. So impacts the gas a little differently. And again, the next generation for TNG um, has um, modified the feedback. So at least gas properties in several regions of clusters are better matched to observations. But for satellites, that, that's not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. So there's possibly something in the feedback to impact um, your satellite count slightly. And you're talking about painting baryons on dark matter only simulations, but then you've also got the ones with baryons in it. Are they okay. just not up to par, or like what, oh, why not just use those? That's a really good question. Um, so like definitely use those, right, to sort of understand, um, well, A, I think the steps would roughly be, right, take a look at as many simulations as you have, see what things are consistent, something like a distribution of satellites, right, and what things are not consistent, so then you know um, what is model dependent. Um, but spanning over model parameters really hides it apart. <laughs> Whereas then, um, and once you understand what things are less sens or more sensitive to your model, then you can start to do this sort of more empirical approach to the pacing, um, where you can just be like, all right, let's do let's search over this in our model parameter space and feed in as much data as you start to get over the next decade. <laughs> or until uh, after lunch tomorrow, so um, if you'd like to talk to her, grab her now to make an appointment or uh, send me an email if you would like as well. Thank you again. Thank you.